It's a fantastic engagement. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sinn Féin are the largest party of the left in Ireland. And uh, we're proud to also describe ourselves as a national liberation movement. As one of my colleagues said to me during the week, Irish Republicans know a little bit about the far right. Uh, he actually said you could say we've been battling them for 800 years. Uh, anyway, uh, and I'll struggle to be able to please. Um, on a more serious note, I mean, Pat Finucane was in the news this week. He was a human rights lawyer murdered by far right extremists in 1989. And your Supreme Court in Britain this week admitted that there's never been a proper investigation into his death. Irish Republicans know who's responsible for his death. His lawyers, extremists, working with the British Security Service. Yeah. In more recent years, we've had the so called flight protesters aided and abetted by Britain First or Britain's Not Talent or whatever they call themselves now. <laughs> and of course, we have the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party. Famously described as the political wing of the 17th century. <laughs> it is backward, racist, homophobic, fundamentalist nonsense. A party that's currently in the centre of your governments and contributing in no small way to all of the current chaos in the world. And by the way, on the backstop, I suppose two things. We know the solution to the backstop. Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of the Irish border. And I want to bring myself because the thing that really winds me up when I'm watching BBC News is they refer to it as the Irish border. It's not the Irish border, it's the British imposed border in Ireland. And that's why it's the Irish The only upside of the DUP being sort of aligned to your government at the moment is that an awful lot more people in Britain understand what we've had to put up with uh, for all these years. But I don't want to talk about how we're combating with far rights in terms, of, in terms of Ireland first, and I'm going to talk about the international context and then a couple of points uh, in terms of what we all need to do together. So, well, we're combating it by insisting on our campaign of an Ireland of equals, by sticking to our task for a rights-based society, a democratic socialist republic. That's what's in our constitution and that's what we're going to achieve. By insisting on marriage equality and language rights in the six counties, on legacy issues being dealt with, and by campaigning for a woman's rights to choose in the six counties. Above all, by campaigning for a border poll. The imposition of Brexit in Ireland is a direct consequence of partition. Partition has stunted economic, political, social, cultural and community development. In the light of Brexit, Irish re reunification is increasingly being seen as the most practical and viable avenue to economic prosperity and social progress in Ireland. Support for Irish unity is also, of course, the only principal position for anti-imperialists to take. So we'll continue to encourage that debate and to argue for constitutional and political change, and we ask for international support for our position from everyone on the progressive left. Now at this point, I do want to raise the topic of nationalism. I think we need to get away from a black and white debate that all nationalism is bad. Nationalism is a weapon used by the far right, but it should not be their sole preserve. There is such a thing as progressive nationalism. We've used nationalism like pride in our history, our heritage, our language, our culture, but it is not to exclude anyone. And I think if you think of the revolutions around the world, the ones I think all of us on the left should be proud of, the revolution in Cuba, the revolution in Vietnam, you'll see the progressive nationalism is very much the heart of those struggles. The struggle for the Great Patriotic War that defeated the Nazis in World War II. That's why it was called the Great Patriotic War. I don't think we should leave nationalism to the far right. We should embrace it and make it inclusive. I want to talk about my work in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where you can increasingly hear the shrill voices of fascism. I want to particularly mention the Fidesz party in Hungary. I want to send my, 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 my solidarity to our comrades from Hungary here today. I'm a member of the Migration Committee in the Council of Europe where I heard Fidesz representatives complain about using the word human rights when speaking about migrants. And I went to the Serbian Hungarian border to see children in cages detained. One lad was 13, no, sorry, 14, 
He'd been there for six months. He can't leave this cage, which is less than half the size of this, of this room here. And they kept him there for over six months. And when I raised it directly with the Hungarian authorities, they had absolute contempt for anything that not just me, but other progressives on the left had to raise. What's happening in Hungary is truly shameful. And here's the thing. The people in the so-called political center absolutely silent on this. The Fidesz party, the Fidesz fascist party, sits in the European People's Party. It sits in the same grouping as the, the, the leading party in my government, Fidesz. again. And when I raise this, because I've raised it a number of times in, in the Irish Senate, as to what they had to say on the topic, and will they call for the expulsion of the Fidesz fascist party, and what I've met with is silence. And let's face it, that's what happened in the 1930s. If we don't demand and continue to demand an ending to the silence of what's happening across Europe, then we are as complicit as everybody else. Yeah. I have not even to mention the Polish Law and Justice Party or the Alternative Germany Party, and again, I have to just tell you their contributions in the Council of Europe are nothing less than horrific and shameless. And of course I have to mention the ongoing shame of Fortress Europe, leaving thousands of migrants to drown in the Mediterranean each year, or paying off governments in Libya and Turkey to keep migrants imprisoned and away from European shores. Indeed, and I raised this this week in the Irish Senate as well, the Irish Navy, and don't forget we're supposed to be a neutral country, I wondered about that, by the way, when I left Shannon yesterday, surrounded by US forces on their way to various wars. But we're supposed to be neutral. But right now, the Irish Navy is handing migrants back to Libya to be raped, to be tortured, to be abused. And if you, I'm sure most of you, my comrades here already know what's happening here, but if you don't, take the time to look at the evidence, the first-hand evidence, absolutely shameful, but the PESCO forces, to which unfortunately the Irish Navy is now aligned, are working to hand over migrants to the Libyan Coast Guard, which is basically handing them to, sometimes their deaths, rape, torture, complete inhumanity. And where is so-called European values that we hear so much about from our so-called elite? So what we're witnessing is the mainstreaming of far-right language and ideas, and one of the reasons this is happening as I said, because there's a wall of silence with regard to these issues, and that silence has to end. Secondly, and I won't dwell on this too much, but I think we do need to learn and recognise the mistakes and failures of the social democratic left across Europe. Um, I mean, let's face it, it was the SPD under Schroeder that brought the Hartz reforms to Germany. It was the Irish Labour Party that acquiesced to the humiliating handover of Irish economic sovereignty and years of crippling austerity. And unfortunately, uh, in the bad old days, British Labour under Tony Blair, of course, championed the Iraq War. But perhaps the biggest failure of social democracy is a failure of vision. The failure to give working class people any hope or vision for an alternative way to run our societies. One that's not compliant with the needs of big business. And I have to say, you know, I don't know how we managed to let the right to take control of this line, take back control. That should be our line. Surely to God take back control of our economy, of our public space, of our health, our education systems. The left needs to offer that vision and connect in a much more direct way to working people. And I was really struck by the comments about what's happening in housing here. It just seems to mirror what's happening at home in Ireland as well, where most of the money spent on housing is actually going directly to private landlords. And surely to God we can come up with uh, a credible economic vision. And I have to say, I think Jeremy Corbyn has done just that in terms of return to decent values around public housing, public health care, and democratic control of our key resources. Comrades, in the face of these challenges, we must not continue to allow Europe to splinter and fragment. We must unite in order to strengthen our collective cause. We must pluralize, not reduce the sites of political conflict. We must endeavor to build a pan-European movement through shared political platforms and common protest initiatives. Again, I want to give an example with some great speakers over in Ireland telling us about the Preston economic model, the community wealth building model, and that this, it's actually economics in action. And we're feeding that into our own economic policies within our party. 
Uh, and that's a kind of shared cross-platform work that's going to be invaluable to us uh, if we're going to build this international movement. It's a mammoth task. We face huge challenges as a continent, as a global community. We must deal with rapidly advancing climate change, an ever-evolving world of cybercrime, and arenas of conflict never thought possible only a few years ago. As a global community, we must urgently meet, meet, meet the needs of the huge refugee movements across the world, a world where citizens are already increasingly on the move for work. There is little doubt we must confront these challenges collectively. We must also stand united and consistent in our rejection and opposition to the continued rise of the extreme ethnic nationalists of the political programs of Orban, Le Pen and Trump. Like those fascist movements who went before them, they will continue to do the dirty work of capitalism. Denying vulnerable minorities political representation while continuing to exploit them in the land of neo-imperial ambitions, not chase a liberal superstate with a common army. We need to dismantle the neoliberal bureaucracy, which is a tumour on the European project, but not abandon the European Union in its entirety. We need to campaign for European-wide public ownership and extensive democratic popular control of the economy. We need to bring an end to the austerity era and embrace labour market reforms that strengthen and extend workers' rights in a real Europe of equals. So comrades, to finish, I want to say it's been an absolute privilege to be here today. I want to extend solidarity from my party to all of you on the left uh, and the struggle for a just and socialist Europe. And you have our support and we look forward to working with you in the years to come. Very well.